Okay. I can't see her PowerPoint there. Have you got her PowerPoint? Yeah, it's right down the bottom. Where is it? Um, I'm not at the minute, just two seconds. Hi, good morning. I'm about to present to you Vivian Panissa, Planning Policy Manager, Land Use Planning and Policy. Vivian is a coastal planning and management professional. She has more than 20 years of experience having worked in roles within the Department of Planning, Lands and Heritage and its former entities. This presentation outlines the coastal planning policy settings with a focus on coastal hazard risk management and adaption planning. Over to you. Good morning. Thanks for inviting me to speak to you today at your, your conference. Um, I'm really going to cover the coastal planning policy and sort of the guidance it provides for recognising, managing and adapting to coastal hazards. Um, please forgive me if I um, my eyes aren't straight forward because I'm uh, not that used to this sort of setup. Anyway, just to outline what I'm going to cover is I'm going to start with the, the broad picture about the policy suite we have in WA um, and its key measures and then identify relevance of, of these to some of WA's heritage places and the sort of assistance that we as a department provide for undertaking sort of the background work you need to inform yourselves um, of the coastal hazards and how to adapt to them. I'll, through this, I should provide you with a, an understanding of the key aspects of coastal planning and management in Western Australia. So starting at the big picture, um, WA has got more than 20,000 kilometres of coast and 80% of our population lives within 10 kilometres of the coast. Around 80% of the state's tourism activity occurs in the coastal zone. In terms of natural hazards, the coast is a naturally dynamic space, which is becoming increasingly so um, due to climate change and specifically sea level rise and also increased frequency and or intensity of storm events and, and erosion. The coast is our first line of defence and it's, and it's our playground and includes a lot of our cultural assets. The coastal zone, WA coastal zone strategy is the state's highest level policy position and it, it sets out an across government and very broad framework that really we hope applies to, to all stakeholders and the community at large about how to plan and manage for the coast. It identifies 13 key issues, not all relating to hazards, 
obviously the location of coastal development and in infrastructure is a very important part. Um, but so is the protection and, and improvement of conditions of some of its key uh, resources, both, co both on the coast and in the marine area. So the, the state coastal zone strategy sets the, the state's vision and which is, I've put in that little box there, a sustainable coast for the long-term benefit of the community and visitors to Western Australia. Its vision is achieved through five broad goals for the environment, community, economy, infrastructure and governance. Each is supported by some detailed objectives. In this slide, I've got some examples of those objectives, but um, in total, there's 32 objectives. What I, one thing I wanted to emphasise or, or specifically point out to you today is that under our community goal to ensure safe public access to the coast and involve the community in coastal planning and management activities, we've got two, um, two key objectives that uh, directly relate to heritage, and that is to protect, conserve, enhance and maintain registered heritage sites and places of cultural significance and to recognise native title rights and Aboriginal people in the coastal zone. Um, moving on, uh, the strategy also has a key statement in, in terms of how to deal with um, coastal hazards and specifically addresses coastal protection and broadly, uh, in, in, uh, in managing and adapting to the coast, the government's position is to avoid as much as possible and as a last resort to put in place protection measures. Where protection measures are considered to be the only resort, only appropriate um, measure to adapt, there's some key uh, matters that have to be addressed prior to that and they include ensuring that you're doing it for the public benefit rather than a private outcome to ensure that it's consistent with a coastal hazard risk management adaptation plan to uh, put in place appropriate funding arrangements that can deal with the, uh, the protection at the time and also its ongoing management uh, limiting any adverse impacts to areas adjacent to those protection works and ensuring that the ownership and responsibility for ongoing management has been identified up front. I use this slide every now and then just um, to explain really our thinking in terms of how to deal with coastal vulnerability. And um, it's all about uh, measuring or at least predicting how the coastline is going to change, how how is it currently changed, how's climate change going to impact that, what are the assets and values that we've got at risk due to those changes, and to use that information to then inform the types of development uh, that we put on the coastal zone, ensuring it's in an appropriate area and ensuring that there's an appropriate management regime. In, in line with the, the state strategy is um, a more detailed uh, state planning policy which provides guidance to decision makers on how to consider any planning or development applications in the coast. Um, you can see that we've got our, our highest level policy is a state planning policy, but it's also supported by two guidelines, the state uh, state coastal planning policy guidelines themselves, which provide interpretation of, of the measures in the policy and our guidelines in terms of how to undertake a coastal hazard risk management adaptation plan. I'm not, um, the overall purpose is to ensure that we manage land use change, to ensure that we have uh, an ongoing coastal foreshore reserve and that it's in public ownership and that we protect, conserve and enhance coastal values. 
um, you can see that a, a critical part of doing that is to undertake our coastal hazard risk management and adaptation planning, uh, but also to encourage innovative uh, approaches to managing coastal hazards, in, particularly in areas where we've got existing development. So I'm not going to go through these in detail, but this is just a slide to show you the, the range of specific measures that are contained in state planning policy, and also to highlight that as part of that policy, we have a, a detailed guideline on how to identify and, um, and measure the coastal processes that are occurring in the area that you're planning for. And a, a critical part of this is um, uh, the establishment of a, a measure for climate change, um, two elements being uh, using the proportionary principle, but the other element is using 0.9 of a metre over the 100 year time frame for sea level rise. That translate, that's a vertical measure. And on the ground, we've, um, we've identified that that should actually be accommodated by a 90 metre uh, area of land. So from the baseline on the coast uh, going landward, you need to allow 90 metres for the coastal processes. Uh, and, um, and then beyond that, you've got to ensure that all the current values of the coast are ma maintained. So that helps us define our coastal foreshore reserve. So the coastal foreshore reserve, um, these provisions are easiest when we've got completely new um, subdivision proposals or what uh, that deal with greenfield sites. And you can see here that we've, it comprises both the, the area for coastal protection against ha hazards, but also an area to ensure that our ongoing recreational, tourism, cultural, um, assets of the coast can uh, continue within that 100 time year time frame. For infield development, and a, and a lot of um, our heritage sites are really subject to this provision. Um, you'll see that in, in that graphic there, the red line represents uh, what where the coastal hazard, uh, coastal processes line falls. For, for infill development or existing development that, that's within the hazard line, there's a range of, of things that um, the policy puts in place. Obviously, you've heard me call coastal hazard risk management adaptation planning, and from now on, I'm going to call it a char map because that's <laughs> a, a lot more efficient. Um, that's an important part of identifying how to uh, uh, manage those hazards on that site. Uh, we also recommend that. Um, that notifications on title are put in place so that current and future owners of, of those properties understand um, that coastal processes is an issue for them. So um, this slide, I'm, I'm not going to explain it, but the, but a char map is quite a complex process and really it can take a couple of years to go through um, preparing a char map most cases it's done by the local government for its area of, of management, but where we have a development application that has development within the hazard area, we'd require the proponent to also undertake a more detailed char map for their project. And on the your right hand side, you'll see the example of the sort of hazard identification mapping that um, is part of this process. So I, this is, I've just put this up as a, provide a little bit more of an example of the sorts of actions that can be undertaken as accommodation in, in this particular slide, um, ensuring that any sort of critical infrastructure is on the highest parts of your property, um, only allowing temporary development within those areas that we've identified as being not at risk at the moment, but will be in the near future. Um, and ensuring that we don't allow any very high value um, and emergency things that can be vulnerable during emergencies within that um, hazard area. So moving on to something that's uh, probably 
closer to your heart, <laughs> we have as a state undertaken a, a, a high level statewide assessment of coastal erosion and identified through this, um, identified that there's 55 coastal erosion hotspots and um, a hotspot is an area that uh, will be impact, is expected to be impacted by coastal erosion or inundation within the next, and require adaptation within the next 25 years. Um, in addition to those 55 hotspots, we've identified 31 watch list sites. So um, we're keeping an eye on those and expect that um, within the next 20 years, um, level of threat will be such that uh, um, pl detailed planning for them will be required. Uh, uh, we have those hotspots now as a layer in the, in the departmental and publicly available um, geographic information system. And what, what I did uh, as part of my preparation for this presentation was to overlay um, that onto our coastal heritage sites layer. And through this, we've identified that of 33 of our, our hotspots contain um, heritage properties. So 60% of, of all coastal erosion hotspots have got heritage properties and are multiple properties in many of those hotspots. Hot 22 of those um, hotspots that uh, contain heritage sites have already got coastal hazard risk management adaptation plans um, in place. And my next few slides are, are really just examples of, of how we've looked at heritage within those coastal hazard risk management adaptation plans. So the Broome Char Map um, includes two key hotspots, uh, town, Chinatown and Town Beach. And um, you can see that uh, we've got some pictures of, of some of the heritage properties there. Um, and just moving to the next slide, this is, provides us, this is an example of the hazard mapping that was undertaken as part of, of the char map. This is the, the detail for Broome Town site. Uh, you can see your heritage properties in there. Um, the important part of this uh, hazard assessment uh, process is that it identifies current, the area that is currently at risk of storm damage, uh, which is the yellow line. Um, if you look at the green line, that identifies the projection for 2020, 2040 in this case. And uh, we've got the orange line for 2070, but for the 100 year time frame, which when this was undertaken was 2110, there's a pink line that identifies the areas that we can consider will be at risk of coastal erosion. Um, and in this case, it also included inundation in, in the assessment. So um, that 100 year time frame is the hazard line we use for identifying um, the coastal hazard area for planning, for today's planning. So within the Broome Char Map community engagement process, um, the heritage values were, were considered. Um, we go through a, pro a process of identifying what assets are at risk, but we also go through a pro process of, of identifying what level of risk um, that uh, would impose on the assets. And really um, through this community engagement process, uh, <laughs> the impacts on coastal heritage sites within the Broome uh, uh, Town Beach site was considered to be, could be catastrophic. As a result, when looking at uh, the options for the site, council and um, have, adopted a, a protection approach and they've been in the process of designing and constructing a, a, a revetment for Town Beach. One already exists, um, they're designing um, one that will be maintained for the longer term and um, it will provide protection for approximately uh, 170 metres of vulnerable shoreline at Town Beach. 
Port Hedland Coast Charmat was uh, another example. Is another example. You can see that um, if I hadn't mentioned it before, the red line um, space there is really our defined hotspot. The green uh, lo locations are registered heritage places, and um, the mul being multiple heritage. Uh, places in this hotspot, um, including the old school, um, light cottage, some, some original dwellings. And um, once again, the community considered these assets as being extremely important and uh, any impact of coastal hazards is potentially catastrophic. So um, the decision to in this area was to um, do coastal protection. I just um, thought I'd show you the ex actual extent of the, the hazard mapping that was used to identify these risks in uh, for this location. Um, the lower right-hand corner is the projected coastal erosion, and the upper right-hand corner, uh, left sorry, the lower left-hand corner, and the upper right-hand corner is the projected inundation. And really, um, for this site, inundation is considered probably it, it is the higher risk. Horrocks Beach, the entire Horrocks area is um, a heritage place. It has six, um, very high um, cultural heritage and Aboriginal uh, heritage uh, uh, importance, and um, the entire system uh, in, uh, in looking at the options for adapting in this site um, there was a lot of concern that putting in place any protection works could be at, inconsistent with the social uh, and, and heritage values of the area so uh, the decision in this coastal hazard uh, risk management adaptation planning was that in the short term, the use of a geotextile seawall and revegetation re of that seawall would be the, the best approach for the short to medium term. Once again, that's an example of the hazard mapping that was undertaken. And my last single slide at, um, example here is for, for Beresford. Um, it contains a number of heritage sites, including a, a railway cottage, uh, houses, churches, uh, smelting works and a fire, uh, flour mill. Uh, the hazard, again, was considered to be catastrophic and the city's approach to this will be to protect uh, using revetments and um, but also to introduce within its planning scheme a special control area and a local planning, local coastal planning policy to, to guide any new and, and future new development or redevelopment within the area and um, to introduce notifications of on titles. So uh, the last part of, of my presentation, I'd just like to highlight that um, through our Coast WA program, which is a $33.5 million investment by the state government over five years. Um, we are providing support to undertake the detailed char map um, process for um, hotspots. We're also looking at doing a, a, an assessment of hotspots based on inundation, which hasn't been done at a statewide level yet. Um, but uh, we are funding the development of those more detailed planning uh, and hazard assessments. They're made available through our own coastal grants programs. There's four specific ones. The commissions uh, really are more focused on the actual coastal reserve um, and the actual planning processes itself. And our colleagues at Department of Transport are, are, are have um, assist in terms of hazard identification and um, the looking at the detailed options for protection. I just want um, 
looking back at, at some of the projects we've funded through our Coast WA program, uh, Coast West program, one of the interesting ones was um, some work done for in the um, in the Leshenot Peninsula Conservation Park. Um, this project was for doing some rehabilitation works to the coastal dunes. In the process of doing it, um, some in very important Aboriginal burial sites were identified. And um, as a result, we uh, included some funding for this specific project to, um, to protect and rebury uh, the remains on those dunes. So let's got to the end of my sh my slide. Um, there's a lot of cult cultural heritage and Aboriginal heritage sites um, within the coastal zone that are either currently and in the future will be impacted by coastal hazards. Um, our state planning policy sets a framework for dealing with those hazards and um, I really also want to congratulate uh, those people working in the heritage area for, for what they're doing um, to protect those, co those heritage sites in the coastal zone. So thank you for listening. And uh, I think we've got a very short period for any questions that I'm not sure. No, sorry, I've been told we haven't. If you've got any questions, please feel free to send them through to um, the Department of Planning, Lands and Heritage. Thank you.